it is a dream to win America's most famous thoroughbred horse race, the Kentucky Derby. For some, this gold trophy, the holy grail of the sport of kings, is the impossible quest. Just getting a horse to Churchill Downs for his once-in-a-lifetime chance to run for the roses on the first Saturday in May is the ultimate challenge. In the second half of the decade of the 1990s, this unlikely horse trainer, Bob Baffert, set off on a three-year ride in the Kentucky Derbies of 1996, 97, and 98, like none other in history. Baffert, a native of Nogales, Arizona, had been a quarter horse trainer at Los Alamitos in Cypress, California. And these are his stories. Get ready for Bob Baffert's excellent derby adventure. It's some kind of ride. This was Bob Baffert's work, quarter horse racing. He started training the equine sprint set in 1975. That year he had 12 starts, no wins, and total earnings for his stable of $372. But by 1986, he had a world champion in his barn, Gold Coast Express, who won over $700,000. In 1988, Baffert had his best year in quarter horse racing, his runners earning over $1.7 million. That was also the year he started training a few thoroughbreds, and with the support of his friend Mike Pegram, gave up his quarter horse night job late in 1991. But it wasn't easy. To finally get there and then to start dabbling in thoroughbreds, I think uh, Mike Pegram, uh, he had so much confidence in me, and that's one of the reasons I, I did it, because he said, look it, I'll back you up. He said, and I told him, I know I won't be able to go into it right away. I'm going to have to learn the game. I have to retrain my thought of training, because basically quarter horse, to train them is totally different. You don't do a lot with them once they get fit. So uh, when I got in, I made, I made a lot of major mistakes, and I went through a lot of money of Mike's, but he understood it, and he stuck with me. It wasn't long after he started training thoroughbreds full-time that Baffert came down with a special type of fever. Derby fever is something when, uh, you know, we all, when I first got into thoroughbred business, you know, you all think about the Kentucky Derby. It's the first thing that comes into mind. So uh, the minute you have a horse that wins, it, it, it's exciting, and, uh, and people are talking about it. Maybe you could have a derby horse or whatever, and, uh, you know, you just broke his mane going six furlongs. You know, that's when it starts. In 1996, after the Santa Anita Derby, Baffert knew he had a serious case of Kentucky Derby fever. The day the Cavanier crossed the wire uh, three lengths in front of the Santa Anita Derby, that's probably the first time I felt I had a Derby horse. Cavanier was a California homebred gelding, a son of Battenier, owned and bred by Robert and Barbara Walter. Well, I always thought in the back of my mind he could be a Derby horse. He had everything going for him. He had the body, the pedigree, uh, the, uh, the distance was not a problem. He won the El Camino Real Derby, and that was one of the first times I really felt that I might have a derby horse. And when I ran him in the San Diego Derby, the mile in the eighth, he just exploded turning for home, and that was one of the most magnificent uh, feelings that the, my first that I had in the business where I knew when he came up and opened up on the stretch, I just felt this feeling of not only of winning the San Diego Derby, but knowing that I have a derby horse, a derby contender, a real contender, and that's a great feeling. Baffert had finally made it to the Kentucky Derby. When you drive into Churchill down, you see the Twin Spires, and you have a Derby contender. You really, you just feel just like walking into Yankee Stadium, you know. You just, you, you can feel the history. Nineteen three-year-olds made up that 1996 Kentucky Derby field. It featured five Colts trained by top trainer D. Wayne Lucas, and an imposing favorite in the Florida Derby and Wood Memorial winner on Bridal Song. When he came off that van, I thought, oh, my God. I said, I'm going to need a bigger boat. I mean, this horse just looked so impressive, you know. And so uh, so I thought, well, just to be, you know, we're in the same barn, and he was getting all the, the attention. And then when he came up with the foot problems and the patch, and it was, it was sort of like, it was really, I'm glad I was stable next to him just to watch all the, the publicity, the, the, the reporters. I couldn't believe I'd never seen so many reporters in my life. Baffert didn't have all the media attention, but he did have a plan for his very first derby. You get caught up in all the excitement and everything, and I saw a lot of, you know, good trainers sort of like get rattled and get off their course of training. They change their training way, so I always thought if I ever go, I'm going to stick to my plan. And so I had a little plan mapped out for him, and uh, I stuck with it, and it worked out, but the horse was training great. And that's one thing about 
Churchill Downs. Once you work the horse, when you work them there the first time, uh, you'll know how you stand. Either like the track or they don't like the track. So uh, with Kevin Ear, everything just went so smooth with the horse. I mean, I've just been so lucky. Despite the foot problems, Unbridled Song went to the post for that 122nd Kentucky Derby as the race favorite. Well, Baffert had the second choice. And they're off in the Kentucky Derby. I can just remember it. I mean, perfect. He was in the good spot. He got behind horses. He saw unbridled. Everything was opening up like we thought it was. Unbridled Song easily takes command from honor and glory. Unbridled Song to the front. The half and 46 three quarters in 110 racehorse time. Midway on the turn. Unbridled Song drawing clear by two. At the eighth pole, he's making this move. He's coming. He's taking the lead. And I'm just like, I can't believe this is happening to me. This horse is, looks like he's going to win the Derby, and I'm looking around, and all of a sudden I see a horse coming, and uh, and I look at it, and I see, and I see it's the Overbook colors. And I say, Oh my God, it's a good one, you know, and uh, and so I'm just like, I'm just, you know, I can sit Steve all my all my years in the quarter horse business and, and the thoroughbred business. This horse is on the lead, and you're just praying, please hold on, and this horse is coming fast. Grindstone is closing stoutly. It's Cavanier on the inside. It's Grindstone on the outside. McCarran and Bailey. Here's the finish. Again, too tight to call. Was it Cavanier on the inside? Was it Bailey with Grindstone on the outside? Noses apart after a mile and a quarter in the Kentucky Derby. And when they hit the wire, it was like, I thought he held on. I wasn't sure, but it was like, I felt this. I, I felt what it felt like to win the Kentucky Derby. It was too close to call. And there would be several minutes delay before the race was made official. But Bob Baffert's wife, Sherry, already knew. She goes, I think you ran second. And I remember, and I go, how the hell would you know? You never even go to the races. How can you tell? And she's like, I think you ran second, Bob. I was like, oh, please don't say that, you know. So I was looking at the riders, and they were showing the riders on the screen. And I didn't like the look I saw on Chris McCarron. He had that look like he wasn't smiling. Please, I was like, please smile, Chris. And uh, Jerry Bailey had a little smile, like he's a lot of confidence. Look, then I was thinking, well, I'll, I'll split it with him. You know, I'll split it right now. I'll go for a dead heat. So they did hang the numbers up. I thought, well, man, how could you come so close, you know? And I thought... Will I ever get another chance? I said, I might never get a chance. It was just so devastating. The photo made it official. On the outside, Grindstone had beaten Cavanier by a nose. The closest derby finish since 1959. Trainer D. Wayne Lucas had won his third Kentucky Derby. And Bob Baffert had lost his first. But Baffert would be back the very next year with a special good luck charm. A great colt named Silver Charm. Almost a year had passed since trainer Bob Baffert had defeat snatched from the jaws of victory in the 1996 Kentucky Derby when Cavanier lost by the smallest of margins in horse racing, a nose. I've never been so depressed in my life. I mean, I was just so like, because thinking with the horses, nobody sends me horses, you know, and I have to develop these horses myself, and the chance of me, you know, take, having another shot, that's what, you know, was going through my mind, and and everybody, you know, luckily my family was there, my wife was there to, you know, uh, if it wasn't for them, they were there for support, saying, you'll be back, you can do it. And uh, so uh, even Bob Lewis, he was there for support. You know, Bob, you did great. You'll be back with a good horse. And, and we had Silver Charm. I just bought Silver Charm. And my brother Bill said, maybe we'll be back with winning with Silver Charm. And Bob go, yeah, right, yeah, like, yeah, right. You know, so, uh, but that's. I'll never forget that. That was, I thought, one thing about it, I said, I got the toughest loss of my career out of the way. Bob and Beverly Lewis were among racing's elite owners of the 1990s. They spent millions of dollars. They had had Eclipse champions, including their Mare Serena song. They were part owners of the 1995 Preakness winner, Timber Country. But what they didn't have was the same thing Bob Baffert didn't have, a Kentucky Derby trophy. The Lewis's liked Baffert's style, and they told him to buy them a horse. They could afford the best, but what they got was a bargain-priced ham sandwich. You know, we gave 85000 for him, so it was one of those things where, you know, Bob asked me, how's he bred? Well, he's, he's a good, you know, he's by Silver Buck, and the mare is a poker mare, and, you know, the bottom doesn't look all that great, but he's, he's a runner. He's an athlete, he's a runner, and Bob's just fine, you know, fine with it. So, uh, so it was one of those things that this horse, you know, got me back in the show otherwise I was I was really I was tailing off there 
So Silver Charm had Baffert back in the show, but the gray coat would really test his trainer. He was so lazy and so laid back, but he was showed a lot of, he would, didn't matter who you worked him with, he worked heads up. I could work him with the worst horse in the barn, he worked heads up. The best horse in the barn, he worked, I mean, that was him. Silver Charm broke his maiden in his second career start, then gave Baffert another touch of derby fever when he came racing up on the outside to win the 1996 Del Mar Futurity by a head. If we're going to go to the derby, this could be our horse. He looked like the type that could do it. But that seemed like a long way away when Silver Charm got sick in January and fell behind in his training. In his first race back as a three-year-old, he broke through the starting gate before the San Vicente Stakes. It came back to win over another gray colt named Freehouse, what would be a developing rivalry. Freehouse evened their series at a win apiece when he beat Silver Charm by three-quarters of a length in the San Felipe. Now the two would square off in the grade one Santa Anita Derby to find out who was the best in the West heading to Kentucky. Homeward bound in the gray Freehouse and Silver Charm shot cat can find no more. Hello and Steel Ruler, but it's Freehouse in front with 50 yards to run. And it's going to be Freehouse. Silver Charm comes right back at him. They run to the wire and get a Freehouse and nose to Silver Charm. The official photo showed number one Freehouse by a head. Jockey Gary Stevens came back with a winning report for Silver Charm's trainer. Gary came back and says, you know, we might have lost uh, the battle, but we're going to win the horse. We're going to win the derby with this horse. And that's when we really got, you know, here I got beat, but I was so happy. I was so, I'm going to get a chance to go back to the derby. The most important hurdle had been cleared. Baffert again had a top derby contender to go back to Kentucky. But how would this Florida bred, who had never raced out of California, handle his first road trip and the track at Churchill Downs? First time I worked him, I'll never forget, he worked like a minute, which is a great work there. And I, I called my wife immediately, says, hey, get the hats ready, we're looking good, you know. So it was exciting to know I had a contender, because when you know you have a contender, that's when you start living the dream of the Derby, and that's when the excitement starts, and everybody gets uh, excited about it. It starts three weeks out. Derby Day 1997 had finally arrived, 365 days after that last first Saturday in May. That photo of the short nose was still on Bob Baffert's mind as he made his second derby walk. It was great. I mean, walking up there, I remember my hands were so clammy, and it was a different walk for me. This was a serious walk for me. The first walk with Kevin Ear was like enjoying the moment. This was, we have to win this race. Silver Charm seemed calm in the paddock, but Baffert was a nervous wreck as he gave final instructions to his two-time derby-winning rider, Gary Stevens. I told Gary, I don't know, I'm glad I'm not riding this horse, because I'm, I'm a nervous wreck. I would never be able to ride this horse. And Gary just had that look of confidence, like, hey, I said, I love this, I get up for this. Wearing saddle towel number six with Stevens in the Lewis's green and yellow silks, Silver Charm broke alertly from post position number five. But soon, he and Gary Stevens would have to make a move that would decide this 1997 derby. Comes around the first turn, it was getting tight. There was a long shot coming in, and just then you could see Gary just pumped him in. There was either split second. You know, that's where the great riders come in. He got him in the hole before this guy could beat him to it. Otherwise, it would have been disastrous. He would have had a check. And that's where the race was won right there in the first turn. There was more excitement to come as Silver Charm came up on the outside of his rival Freehouse in the stretch. But Baffert was waiting for the challenge of the derby favorite in the green and red silks, Captain Bodger. Freehouse gets the lead. Silver Charm on the outside, open at the rail, back to third. And here comes the captain, and down the stretch they come. Silver Charm to the front. I said, this horse is not going to deny me this race. He can't deny me this race. I said, God, you can't do it to me again. You can't, you can't deny me this race. So uh, when he came to him, you could just tell Silver Charm just saw him. And I had so much confidence in the horse. And I knew once he saw him, he wasn't going to let that horse. And that last 50 yards, I mean, I've never ridden a horse as hard as that horse. I mean, I was just like, to me, that will be my greatest win ever in the Derby. I mean, that was one of those things where when he hit the wire, I was just like, I was, my stomach was killing me, my stomach muscles from just cheering that horse on. And I remember turning around to Bob Lewis and grabbing him. I, I, I almost broke him in half. I hugged, <laughs> I hugged him so hard. And it was one of those things where it was like the Cavanier loss was just like out of my system. It was like the monkey was off my back. And it just, the Derby, it just, it's the greatest race in the world. I mean, um, 
I don't care. I've, I've won all these big races, but that race is just it's an unbelievable feeling. It's just something that and you never get over it. Bob Baffert's first Kentucky Derby winner, Silver Char. The great Colt would go on to win the 1997 Preakness by a desperate head over Freehouse on his inside and Captain Bodgett on the outside. He would then make the first attempt of the 90s to sweep the Triple Crown. But at the Belmont, Silver Charm fell short by less than a length. Still, Baffert had the prize he wanted the most, and he dedicated that 1997 Derby win to his longtime friend Mike Pegram, who introduced him to thoroughbred racing. In 1998, Baffert would be back again at Churchill Down with an unlikely three-year-old colt purchased by Pegram for just $17,000. His name, Real Quiet. His nickname, The Fish. Here's a horse I bought from Mike Pegram. I call him The Fish because from the side, he, he looked like a tropical fish. From the side, he looked great. And, and you look at him front, real narrow, looked like a tropical fish. That's how he got his nickname. And, and here's a horse but always showed us a lot of talent, but he never could really get with the program. He just it was... It's another thing. The distance was killing him. So finally, after getting him beat about six times, whatever, running him short, you know, really smart trainer, I mean, wasn't straight, you know. But we knew once I, I, I uh, stretched him out, he's going to be a good horse, and he showed us in December when he won the uh, Hollywood Paternity. Meanwhile, Baffert's attention and everyone else's on the West Coast was on real quiet stable mate, Indian Charlie. He was undefeated in four starts, including this two-and-a-quarter length win over Real Quiet in the Santa Anita Derby. But in Kentucky, it was Real Quiet who started to bloom as he took to the Churchill Downs racetrack, well, like a fish takes to water. I remember I, I told Mike, I go, Mike, he was up there, and I go, Mike, you got a good chance of winning this thing. That horse is, I mean, that horse is unbelievable, the way he's training. I think, you know, he could win it. Derby Day 1998, and a field of 15 paraded to the post with Indian Charlie, the favorite under jockey Gary Stevens. Real Quiet and his rider, Kent DeSormo, would go off as the fifth choice at almost 9 to 1. As the field approached the final turn of that 124th Kentucky Derby, Bob Baffert could hardly believe what he was seeing. I'm there and I'm watching, all of a sudden all I can see is Indian Charlie making his move and I'm thinking, all right, here we go again, man, we're coming on, we're looking good. They're backing up in front of us. Then all of a sudden, I see this horse make this humongous move on the outside, like I'm thinking, oh my God. He says, who is that? You know, like, oh, I'm going to, this horse is moving by Indian Charlie. And all of a sudden, I see the colors, and I say to myself, I'm with Ella, I go, my God, it's the fish. They're at the top of the lane in the derby, and real quiet on the outside gets the lead. Indian Charlie in second in Cape Town is racing third, but gaining. Victory gallop from far back is fourth, and moving up, Hallery under his next. Down the stretch they come. Real quiet leads it. Victory gallop on the outside with a last desperate move. In the final stride, real quiet can destroy Mahomes. Yes, real quiet wins it. Bob Baffert, two in a row. On the outside, it was Victory Gallup who came from absolutely last to finish second. There is a God. How can this happen? Here's the guy that got me in the business. Went through the whole Triple Crown with me last year, and here he is winning the Kentucky Derby. It was just an unbelievable experience. While jockey Kent DeSomo and owner Mike Pegram celebrated their first derby victory with real quiet, Baffert had just won his second in a row, something only five other trainers had ever done before. But the ride wasn't over for Baffert and company. Two weeks later in Baltimore at the Preakness, real quiet again made his powerful move on the turn and won by more than two lengths. Baffert had become the first trainer in history to sweep the first two jewels of the Triple Crown the Derby and the Preakness in consecutive years. At the Belmont, real quiet, the $17,000 bargain colt that nobody wanted was trying to become racing's 12th Triple Crown winner and the first in two decades. Also at stake was the $600,000 winner's check of the first million dollar Belmont purse and the Visa $5 million Triple Crown bonus. As real quiet went to the post against 10 challengers, he was made the favorite for the first time that spring. The main threat again appeared to be the Derby and Preakness runner-up, Victory Gallop. It would be a race for the ages. As they straighten away in the lane of the Belmont, real quiet takes command. A roar from the crowd as he bounces away by three and a half lengths. Thomas Joe is closing. Victory Gallop is now second. Down the stretch they come. Real quiet is run. Here comes Victory Gallop. 
Phillips with Gary Stevens. It's real quiet to Carmel, but on the outside, victory Gallup, too tight to call. For Bob Baffert, another photo. He and the real quiet team had lost the triple crown by victory Gallup's nose. 11-8, and I said, oh, we got beat. And my wife was there, and I go, oh, we got beat. I said, yeah, that's terrible, isn't it? Oh, it's terrible. Come so close, like, oh, it's terrible. And I had my little Savannah and my little four-year-old girl in my, in my arms, and she said, but Daddy, you still got me, and that thing just brought me right back, right back to reality. Once again, Baffert had been denied the Triple Crown. But for Bob and his best pal, Mike Pegram, it was worth the ride. The one thing about Mike and I, we enjoyed every moment of that. We got our $5 million worth. The money was never a factor. I never counted on the money. I never had it. When you don't have it, and... Uh, Mike would have paid $5 million to be in that situation. You can think when it's that close, you know, you can think maybe this or maybe that, but, you know, we got the Kentucky Derby, and I told Mike, you know, that, we didn't get that, but it was a great ride, we enjoyed it, we had the greatest time, it's something we'll always remember the rest of our lives. Trainer Bob Baffert with his back-to-back -back Kentucky Derby winners. 1997, the gray silver charm. In 1998, the bay real quiet. Both won the Derby and the Preakness, and then just missed the Triple Crown at the Belmont. But for Baffert, there were no regrets at what might have been, and no comparisons to winning the Roses. I know it was about history. It would have been great to win the Triple Crown and the money and all that and the history, but it doesn't compare with winning the Kentucky Derby. And consider this. In his first three Derby starts, Bob Baffert was just over a nose away from winning three consecutive Kentucky Derbies when Cavanier was caught at the wire in 1996. That's an amazing feeling. I mean, it's the only time you ever feel anything like that in your life. I've never felt that in my life. I've, you know, I don't care. I could win the lottery. I mean, you're never going to feel that, that feeling. It's just something because you get to, you know, if you the way you could push a button and replay it in your mind, that stretch drive is the most amazing, incredible and that's why we keep going back. That's why those yearling prizes, I can never believe, how can these horses be bringing so much money because of that feeling that we get watching these horses come down that lane. It's the greatest thing that can happen to a horse trainer in his life. You know, you can train and you can train and win every title and everything, but that one derby, that's, that's the thing that will always stay with you forever.